Great. We are here on behalf of uh, the Liver Transplant Society of India. And um, I think I sent you a copy. We have our uh, newsletter and uh, we would like to interview you. And um, this, is an, uh, this is not about your academics or anything. We want to get up close and personal with you. Okay, yeah, now just uh, what I would like to uh, focus on what can help your society and the young generation, that's all. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, you know, any stories or any uh, thing I learned over the years and, and how, uh, where did we, uh, how are we, why we're here today and stuff like that. Okay, sir. So, uh, shall we start? Yes. Can you, uh, so, uh, Amanda? Amanda. <laughs> can, <laughs> can, can we get the uh, voice up a little bit? Or no, it's, it's your computer. It's, we can log on on my laptop. It'll be louder. It's their computer? No, it's your computer. My computer is the bad one? Yeah, because your speakers are down here. And so it's it, we it's at the full yeah see it's full yeah volume. The full. but if you want me to pull it up on my laptop it'll be louder. Um, I don't know, uh, but can you hear me good? That's all. That's we can count. hear you just fine. Absolutely okay. fine. Yeah, it's just because your your speakers are down here. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. That. Okay. All right. And this is only visual uh, uh, audio, right? Not or or both. Uh, is it an audio or also? Uh, We'll uh, we'll have a like an audio visual uh, uh, audio visual session, so that mm -hmm. we can have a link to the audio visual session, and we'll also transcribe it so people can read it later. Oh, all right. Okay, go ahead. Um, you want a cup of tea, Doctor Reddy? You want a cup of tea? No, I'm good, thank you. It's too late okay. for us. <laughs> okay. All right, sir. Okay. So, so Doctor Karim, first question. Uh, please tell us about your early training in surgery and how you entered the then embryonic field of transplant surgery. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Hirak. Uh, uh, let me give it uh, some thoughts here. Uh, you know, it, uh, actually, uh, to start with, the reason I was became interested in the field of uh, medicine or in the medical field in general because I lost my father when I was six years old and I was always searching for a reason why did he die and how can I dedicate my life to help other kids because my father died when I was six years old as I said so I'm trying to see how can prevent this from happening to other kids and then uh, when medical school uh, in, uh, in Egypt, uh, in the Delta area called Mansoura University, and uh, uh, I never thought about anything, but one thing, uh, and, you know, to end my life on earth is to innovate in the field and help the poor people. Uh, that's exactly what uh, was my goal. And I realized that, you know, Egypt as a developing or underdeveloped country at the time that the, uh, the, the field and environment would not allow me to be prepared to take uh, on my mission and uh, advance in the field in general, the medical field in general. So as, as you, you may know, Hirak has been a little bit eccentric and, and uh, not uh, someone that uh, you can figure out very quickly. Uh, and uh, uh, to start being attracted by many professors in Egypt, uh, even when I was taking my final medical exam, and then uh, uh, the dean of the medical school at the time, who was a surgeon, uh, you can see maybe I'll show you his picture here, the top picture uh, there. Uh, yes. That's Professor Farouk, who was uh, trained in England, and uh, he was very motivated and interested in innovation in surgery. So I start, he uh, 
steal me for, from another uh, departments and uh, became interested in gastroenterology at the time and liver disease, both together, a uh, uh, unit called the gastroenterology unit, which is still uh, doing a large number of liver transplant there at the present time. Um, and then I soon realized after I finished my residency and I get a master degree that I want to come to the United States uh, to help me uh, to shape up my, my uh, career and hopefully to accomplish my mission and uh, fulfill my dream uh, since I was a child. Then, uh, <clears throat> interestingly enough, the Mansoura University, uh, 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 on behalf of the Dean, Professor Farouk, refused to let me come for a fellowship in, in the States because they knew that if I come, I may never return back. And they, uh, so I uh, find my way. I came to the United States without their permission. They fired me. And uh, six months after they fired me, since I had the Sadat Prize a year before at the chief residence in Egypt, the whole country heard about it. So they contacted me again and they promised me that I will do whatever I want to do but he need, I need to go back and then they give me the assistant professor position, which has happened. Then I came uh, to Atlanta in um, the first trip was February 13, 1983. Stayed six months in, uh, at uh, Wayne State University working in Interleukin II at the time with Professor Bloki. They became also very, very interested to keep me there. And they were very upset that I decided to leave. And then I went back to Egypt, came uh, back, I think, uh, in June uh, uh, 1984 to work with Dean Warren because there was a lot of patients. I didn't know if you uh, have the similar situation or you had similar situation in India. There was schistosomiasis in Egypt. And there was a lot of young generation dying from uh, variceal bleeding uh, with uh, normal, basically normal uh, liver functions. So I came at that time, Dean Warren developed his procedure called the Warren shunt, as you may know, or distal spleen or renal shunt. And I came, I did my PhD with him in Atlanta uh, with another professor, uh, Professor Salam, which is of, uh, of uh, Egyptian origin. And uh, then I did my PhD. <clears throat> I, at that time, I met uh, uh, Thomas Starzl in the uh, American College of Surgeon meeting and uh, Dean Warren. Dr. Hakeem Mostafa, Chicago. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dean Warren was the president of the American College of Surgeon. And uh, he was also very interested uh, in, in my personality. And, you know, some these people, they usually can see through you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so it became uh, very challenging for me to leave Dean Warren. I met Dr. Starzl and I told him, I'm very interested to come and work with you. He didn't even look at me. And uh, he, he, can, he was presenting about the first... Uh, 15 cases that he did in, in the 80s. This is, was 84 and showed that the survival is improving with the cyclosporin and he, he start having long-term uh, successful outcome about a year or two with the isolated liver transplant. Mm -hmm. So I ran after him on the escalator. I vividly remember I said, Dr. Stalzo, uh, uh, I am Egyptian and I work with Dean Warren and I want to come and work with you. He said, come over. I talked to Dean Warren and he refused. He said, no, you're not going, he's going to ruin your life. And uh, he lies, all this data is wrong. And uh, well, I said, well, I really still want to go. And he said, no, either you go back to Egypt or you stay with me. Uh, so at that time <coughs> I got married. Uh, and I decided to go and finish my PhD because I believe that nobody ever tried to burn his or her own bridge to their own country. You always have to have something. And with my mission <laughs> that I have 
in the back of my head since I was a child, I want to go back and help my uh, people in, in my home country because we owe them this. Uh, they are the one who made us the way you are now. Uh, not America, not nothing. It, it's, 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 it's your home country who made you to start with. And uh, uh, so I, I went back to Egypt. I finished my clinical part of the PhD. I uh, contacted Stasel from Egypt. He said, You're, are, you, are, are, are you Dean Warren Boy? I said, yes. Uh, there was no, uh, there was no uh, computer or anything. So it was letters. So he said, I'm afraid I might don't have a position for you. Uh, despite that, I went to, to uh, uh, at that time, Dean Warren contacted me in 86 and he said, uh, saw my wife because she was in Atlanta with the baby at the time, my oldest baby, Adam. And he told him, where is Kareem? He needs to, uh, I'm waiting to uh, see him. I, I would love him to come and work with us. At the time, he had a metastatic disease of a squamous cell carcinoma in his orbit, and he had hemifacial excision. And uh, Deneen uh, uh, called me and she said, uh, Dr. Warren wants to see you. I said, I'm coming in June. Uh, two weeks later, uh, this was in May, uh, she called me, she said he passed away. So I never had a chance to see him again. And then I uh, uh, went to, uh, to uh, still in, my, in the back of my head that uh, me and Susan have a lot in common. And I contacted him again. He said, again, I don't have a position for you. So I actually took everything from Atlanta and I went to his office. And uh, I saw he met first time I met him. He looked at me. He said, "Who are you?" I said, "I'm so so so." I met you, and you know, give him the story. He said, "Why did you come? I didn't have a position for you." I said, "Still, I want to work with you." That's it. This is all true stories. So uh, uh, he said, "Okay, go and work in the lab." At the time, Toto, or the uh, you may, if you don't know him, he's a great surgeon from Japan and the stars have attracted him and he brought the uh, program for K5 or 6 and he was doing uh, uh, a lot of multivisceral animal studies at the time. He said, go and join Toto. So I went and I spent about a month with Toto and it was totally a Japanese mafia. Nobody speaks English, all Japanese. <laughs> And uh, I started having jaw pain because I cannot talk to anybody. I'm just watching and observing. And that's what come to your uh, teaching point that, you know, it's uh, the learning, not just hand on. Uh, it's a visual, it's proprioception, uh, it's memory. It's a lot of stuff, as you may know, Hirak and Dr. Reddy. And then um, I started helping the, I didn't even have a license and take this off the records. And the, the surgeons at the time, Starzl was crazy about introducing uh, FK5 or 6, we call it PROGRAF now, to, uh, to be a, an immunosuppressive agent after uh, say Roy Khan failed uh, to develop it in England and was claimed that it's a very toxic drug because he, they used to hide overdose and used it in dogs. And you guys may know that uh, the FK is a very toxic to dogs, particularly dogs, and make them develop vulvas of the intestine. So all of his experiment failed because they used it the wrong model. And then uh, uh, start to the FK, start showing some efficacy in the, in the animal study, and then start to the human uh, trial. At the time I was helping, uh, you know, you didn't have to have license to scrub at the time. So any visitors come from anywhere, can come and scrub. And uh, I'll start to scrubbing with the guys and uh, they start getting crazy. They, everybody wants me to scrub with that. With each one called me, five, six of them to scrub was John Fang, was uh, Satoru Toto, was uh, Andy Tazakis because he was there before me. And uh, Adrian Kezavela, Oscar Branister, all these guys 
they will start to doing a transplant. There was just uh, uh, came to be trained as fellows and there was not a fellow at the time. So uh, John Fung and other went to Dr. Stardew and he said, this guy, what's his name, Kareem, he can do the liver transplant better than us. So he his secretary called me. She said, are you uh, Dean Warren's boy? He used to call me Dean Warren's boy early on. And I didn't realize that there was a lot of competition between Dean Warren and Thomas Starzl. Uh, it's a long story that uh, it needs another two or three hours to uh, talk about it. But I went to his office. He said, uh, do you want a, a, a position? I heard you're damn good. It is, used to say that. I said, yeah, well, well, they told you I'm damn good. I'm damn good. He said, do you really need to do a fellowship? I said, whatever. I am working free now. I, I, I didn't have any financial resources. He said, okay, I would give you a position, but you promised me you would never leave me. And I told them I will never leave you. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so he gave me, uh, uh, I spent about two or three months as a fellow, and then he gave me an attending position at the time, assistant professor at the university. And that was uh, at the beginning of my story with uh, liver transplantation. And then he uh, 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 drove me crazy with the, with the, int with the clinical uh, introduction of uh, ProGraph and I used to take care of the heart, lung, uh, kidney, everything, day and night. And um, uh, since then, we uh, became uh, very close friends uh, until he passed away. And that's the, what introduced me uh, to the field of organ transplant in general. And uh, with the introduction of the, with the, with the successful outcome with the clinical trial for about eight months, I was started, I think, in February 1989. And then we showed the efficacy of program with the, with the, uh, with the liver transplant. Then he um, uh, called me to his office. I said, I did, he said, Kareem, I did a uh, liver transplant. Uh, I did this intestinal or multivisceral transplant in 83, 84, and uh, uh, the, uh, failed because cyclosporin was not good enough for this patient. And uh, with the program we have now, I want you to launch a uh, small bowel multivisceral transplant program. And I know you're the youngest one here, and I know that you can uh, definitely make it work. And uh, Andy and Toto, although they are senior here, they came before you, they would be involved. And that's what the, uh, another, uh, another day when I was uh, introduced to develop this mobile and multivisceral transplant. So that is a wonderful story and we are so glad to hear it from your own words. Mm, so some, <clears throat> What about, uh, you've worked so long with uh, Professor Starzl and you were one of his friends and pet students, if I may say so. You have a lot of stories to share about him. Give us a couple of really nice stories, whichever you think. I've heard a lot of stories from you, but our readers would like to hear a couple of really good stories. Yeah, well, um... Starzl uh, was somebody that uh, you can't earn his trust very, uh, very, very uh, quickly. And he tests you in every, every way that he can. And, but once he's trust you, uh, then uh, there were no barrier uh, at all between you and him. And he rarely uh, trust anybody. And he established a relationship with people according to his needs and according to their personality. So he, deal, he dealt with John Fung for administrative work because he trusted him that he would not do anything without his approval. Uh, with me, uh, became very close friends, very, very close friends to the extent I know everything about his daily life and his family affairs and will never make a decision without asking me my opinion. Uh, the 
how did he earn this trust? Uh, how did they earn his trust? So he start, we start doing the study of the FK506 on the heart, lung, uh, liver, and kidney at that time. We did no intestine at that time for about a year and a half. So we used to make rounds Iraq, like what I used to do with you here, and, and then make uh, you know decisions in the morning, and that's it. In the afternoon, maybe take a look at the patient, see what happened. Uh, the, uh, I go and them, you know, call me at around one o'clock in the morning. He said, Karim, can we make rounds? I said, sure. So to the extent uh, they, there was an operator at the time, there was no phone. The operator used to call me, he said, your friend wants you on 10D or 10F or whatever uh, at one o'clock in the morning. I said, okay. So we used to go and make rounds and then I go back home around three or four and then I go back to, to, to do the daily work at six, seven o'clock. And then he see me, I, so of course, before I go and see him or he, I know that he's gonna see me, I go and take a look at the patient because I know he's gonna ask me about them. So, uh, you know, I, you, he used to go before me and change the dose at FK that would change it 10 times for in the patient the whole day. Because at that time, we didn't have a prograph level. We, we went uh, with the adjusting the dose according to um, our clinical judgment, our clinical symptoms of the patient. And uh, you, he used to go after he make rounds with me and make changes. And then three hours later, he met me. He said, what happened to Mr. So-and-so? I said, so-so. He said, what is the progress dose? And I told him, you went an hour ago, you changed the dose from this to this. Okay, so he, uh, well, this was frequently happening. And that is uh, one of the stories that tell you uh, earning a trust uh, of somebody, uh, it's not easy. You know, you have to work on it. You have to pay attention to it. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is definitely a lot of fun stories. Uh, when he in, 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 uh, wants me to uh, start to being a, a, an attending, I don't have a license. Mm -hmm. So um, I start seeing patients without a license. So I went to the emergency room and there was a patient have massive bleeding and we used to do liver transplant for patient with acute variceal bleeding because nobody was competing with us. So I, by the time I went to the emergency room here, I can doctor read the patient was dead. Oh I said, shit, what happened if I was there and he died. Who is going to do the death certificate? Who's going to write a note? And I don't have a license. So I went to his office. I said, Dr. Sazel, I cannot see patients anymore. He said, what happened? I told him. He said, okay. Terry? Yes, Dr. Sazel. We're leaving the office. We're going to call the medical uh, office that in, in, was in Pittsburgh, uh, the guy, the R Russian guy or the Ukrainian guy, and, and fortunately, who was a medical examiner. And he was a famous medical, he's still a, a life, a famous medical examiner. He was the medical director that issued the license. So uh, uh, Berber started with B, I can't remember his phone name. Tell the, call his office, tell him that I'm coming. We went to in his car very old car, doesn't have a brakes. And he was driving, that's true. We were driving on, on, um, on the Fifth Avenue. And he, the, the, I said, Dr. Sazer, the, the, uh, the, the light is gonna become red. He said, I can't stop the car. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a brake. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Then I said, shit, uh, hopefully we'll come back. I have young kids. So we went, uh, uh, Dr. Berber, or Berber, Berber, his name was Berber, uh, office. And he said, uh, I'm here uh, uh, because uh, this uh, young Egyptian guy, he is brilliant and I want to hire him, but he doesn't have a license. Can you offer license? Can you get a license for him today? He said, Dr. Samson, I cannot do that. 
How can I do that? Um, he, you need to have documentation. You want me to go to jail? He said, what do you want him to do? He said, he needs to go to his medical school, get all the documentation, and I can get him in, the we used to call it at the time, an institutional license, because I didn't have a training here in the United States. Um, so we went back to the office. I said, Terry, get a ticket to Kareem to go to Cairo tomorrow. This is what things happen. Mm -hmm. So next day, he said, go spend two days with your mom and get all the medical records, medical certificates from Egypt, and you come back on Friday. And that's exactly happened. I went back on Friday, get the thing, get me the institutional, institutional license in one week. So uh, at the time, you can see that uh, he was very powerful. And uh, Ching, you know, a year or two before he passed away, I said, Dr. Stossel, you could not achieve what you achieved 20 years ago today. You would be in jail rather than being in your office. He said, you're absolutely correct. Um, another story, when I tried to do the residency, he was totally against it. Um, and he said, uh, uh, you're going to do your, you get a board certified and you're going to be a chairman somewhere and you leave me. I said, I promise you, I'm not going to leave you. I promise you from day one, I'm not going to leave you. I just want the, the uh, board to be certified so I can do all the logistics uh, with the American government to get uh, Medicare, uh, to get the small bottle multivisor approved at the standard of care. He said, well, do whatever you want me to do. What do you want to do? I Do whatever you want. You're outside the system. You're out of, of my mind. So I said, it doesn't matter. I know what I'm doing. So I uh, was uh, interesting because there was a competition between Department of Surgery and Transplantation. So the Department of Surgery tried to uh, steal me from him and the punishment. So Nick Simmons called me, he said, I have a fourth year residence position for you so you can get board certified because the American board contacted me and they told me stars would want you to be board certified without any training in Egypt, the, and without any training in the United States. That time was Dr. Griffin, um, I, the one who first they did the gastrojejunostomy, the, uh, the drainage of the stomach with the gastrojejunostomy. So Starzl a week before called, contacted him in the office and uh, he said, uh, Cardi, uh, I have this Egyptian guy. This was about a year after uh, I was an assistant professor and he's crazy. He wants to be board certified. And his CV is better than yours and everybody else. You know, he used to exaggerate things. And I want you to get him board certified. He said, Dr. Stossel, we never done this to anybody. He, ha he has to do at least one year uh, uh, surgical training as a chief resident. Otherwise, we would not be able, you know, it's impossible. I cannot convince the board of the American Board of Surgery, uh, uh, board members with that. So Simmons heard about it. At the time I went, I uh, trying to push them off, uh, you know, harder, make them get nervous. So Dr. Bailey, the one who did uh, baby Faye, uh, first a uh, baby heart transplant uh, in humans, he was in Loma Linda and they contacted me, said, you wanna come if you wanna do the residency? Because there was a guy, his name is Eric Anderstrom. Uh, he told uh, Bailey, Bailey contacted me and he said, if you want to do a residence, come, we'll give you a year or two years, but you stay with us. Starzl heard about it. Dick Simmons heard about it. They went crazy. Mm -hmm. So Simmons called me to his office and say, we'll give you the residency training a uh, year or so, so you can be birth certified, but you stay with us, you don't go to Stalzel again. I said, no, that I'm not, I'm one with my word. I will, as long as it's Stalzel here, I will be with her, but I will be the catalyst and the ambassador for both of you. And I established a better relationship between both of them until Stalzel died. 
And Dick Simmons is writing a book about history of surgery. And actually I'm going tomorrow uh, to spend the day with him because he said, you are an important part of this book and he's gonna interview me. Wow. Uh, so after, when I decided to do the residency, I was in the first paper about the randomized study of FK506 and efficacy with liver transplant. And my name was second after John Fung because he wrote the paper for both of us. Mm -hmm. He called me at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was doing a chief residence rotation at the VA hospital uh, close to the Center Avenue and his house was about two minutes walk. Two o'clock in the morning, I get a call from him. He said, are you asleep? I said, no, I'm, in, uh, I'm uh, at the VA hospital uh, on call. He said, can you, come to my, uh, can you come to the house? I said, yeah. He said, where are you? He said, I'm in the top on the attic um, and uh, I left the door open for you so you can, uh, so uh, Joy is sleeping so we don't have to wake her up. This is, was in 1996. I went upstairs and he was in an attic about, you know, one by one, uh, meters, if you use the meters, small, tiny thing on the desk and writing the paper, finishing editing the paper on the randomized study. It took him about six months to write it. And uh, he said, I want you to review this paper. Uh, so he gave me, you know, gave me piece by piece paper, I mean, page by page, and uh, gave me the last page was the front page. And he said, did you see the authors? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, your name is there? I said, no. He said, that's what you deserve when you leave the system. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't care. I don't care. I believe in what I'm doing. To reach the end of the story, after I finished the residency program, mm -hmm. uh, the day I finished, I went to the office and there was a, a dozen of yellow roses. And um, I told the, the secretary, um, I said, who brought this here? She said, Dr. Stiles will send it to you, congrat congratulating you on finishing your residency. Then I called him to thank him. He said, well, I usually don't ever say it, never said it in my life, but I was wrong, Karim. You did the right thing. So that is stories about him. Uh, it's his stories that tell you, teach you uh, lessons in life uh, that uh, you should, uh, if you believe in, believe in your mission, regardless uh, of other people uh, view that you should pursue it. And also, uh, if you're honest and sincere and you love your patients, uh, there's many stories about uh, me and him fighting for patient care. And when I fee see him is shifting uh, in a biased way, never been biased or, or bad things, but he just trying to prove his point sometimes. And sometimes the patient pay the price. So I just, well, most of the time I use a break, although huge difference, a gap between him and me, but over the years will become, um, um, many times he said, Karim, please do not. He said, Karim, did I ever insult you in public? I said, no. He said, well, if I say something, you don't agree on it, don't argue with me in public, come to the office and we can discuss it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that is uh, what the young generation need to learn, that, um, uh, you know, perseverance, uh, honesty, loving the patients, and uh, respecting and admiring uh, your mentors. Uh, it's everything in life. Well, Dr. Karim, that is really inspiring. Um, let's come to some a personal question. Uh, tell us right now about your family a little bit and how you manage to achieve a healthy work-life balance? Yeah, this is a very good question. And uh, definitely, uh, if you look at the history and if time comes for me to write my diary and you will see uh, me and Sarsal where we have a very parallel life. 
-hmm. And the reason for that, because uh, there is nothing without a price. And it's a, sometimes it's a matter of choice and uh, you cannot sometimes see it or uh, look at it at the time. But if you go back and uh, over time, you can um, uh, see what did you do right, what did you do wrong. Um, uh, of course, I, I have two boys, Adam and Ahmed, they're 34 and 32. And uh, uh, I have my second wife, Kay, my first wife, Deneen. Uh, she could not tolerate um, not being with her all the time for the first, uh, when we moved, because she, when we married, we went to Egypt for two or three years. I could not accommodate, I felt that still is going to be uh, my mission is to go back to the United States when I contacted Stalso. And um, mm -hmm. I definitely ignored uh, my family for a few years uh, under the uh, naive impression that they understand what I'm going through and why I'm doing this to secure their future. Kids do not understand that. Wife would not understand that unless somebody really uh, uh, have uh, uh, raised herself to the level that she can see the uh, the future. Some women don't, uh, and I don't. I wouldn't blame them because they want to live their life. Uh, so uh, for about five six years, uh, I was really day and night with Starzo. And I didn't realize, although I tried to spend as much time as I can with the kids over the weekend, uh, it still was not enough for them. And that left some scar in them up to date. And uh, uh, some, uh, some of the kids can understand when they grow up, which they do now better than before, uh, to the extent uh, sometimes uh, Adam, he was eight and said, Dad, do you think you, live, you love your patient more than you love us? So my take to him, I said, Adam, you're wrong. Uh, you will know in the future when you grow up that I love the patients because I love you more. I would not love the patient if I don't love you. And uh, uh, when we discussed it recently, he, you know, totally uh, understand and said, you know, kids usually don't see. And uh, I think that was one of the lessons I learned that I did not pay attention to them when they were growing up. And you can't, you can't replace this period of time, no matter what I do for them. And the same thing was uh, my first wife. Um, it was, uh, she was a victim of uh, my dedication uh, to uh, my career and was my dedication is impulsive feeling that I have to do something for the human being. Um, and we're still friends and I'm very happily married with my wife Kay now for 16, 17 years. I have a very good friend with my, it was Denine. She never she, I took care of her um, uh, even when she had these uh, issues uh, and the kids who were with us all the time. I, I used to take them to my office when I do the transplant uh, and take care of them at the same time. I took them all over the world uh, and trips. Uh, so the, still the price uh, for dedication uh, sometimes uh, uh, you can afford it, or sometimes you cannot afford it. Starzo did not afford it. Starzo had the similar situation. He had two marriages, and uh, his kids felt the same way about him. And uh, but uh, uh, I was uh, learning from his experience, and once stopped waking up after seven or eight years so that I secured. Uh, and people knows who I am and they trust what I do and uh, I'm, I don't feel no longer being a, uh, a, you know, somebody from Egypt or somewhere. I felt like I'm equivalent to anybody that I work with. 
uh, and start being uh, very valuable to the medical field and the, uh, the institution with the University of Pittsburgh, I start uh, having some sense of security and I start paying attention to the kids and the family, but it's, the damage was already there. So it's uh, my advice always uh, to uh, uh, young generation that try to keep the balance and, um, and definitely the family should be a very uh, valuable part of your life. And uh, uh, sometimes very difficult, easy to do, uh, easy to say than do, but my advice to the young generation, always keep the balance, but don't use your family as an excuse for you not to achieve your scientific goal. Sir, um, can you tell us how you met Kay, your wife? Oh, uh, the, my first wife, Deneen, she used to work in the radiology department when I did my PhD uh, with Dean Warren at Emory. And I was very naive, uh, Egyptian guy, barely could speak English. And, uh, but, uh, I, you know, for some reason, my personality attracted women. I didn't know why. Maybe my, my eyelashes, I have no idea. So uh, she started, uh, uh, we started having a, a, a friend relationship and she was doing all the x-rays for my PhD and stuff like that. So I took her out for dinner. Uh, first question I asked her, I said, can you bring your husband with you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's true. She said, I didn't have a husband. I said, oh, are you divorced? She said, no, I never been married. I don't have kids. I never had relationship. And so, so she attracted me with her personality. Uh, so we get married. We went to Egypt. Uh, she really doesn't want to come to the United States, but I felt like I'm going to suffocate in Egypt because I don't believe in private practice. I don't. If the, uh, Egypt is not going to uh, help me to achieve my goal in advancing the medical field. So I came back. I told you the story about Dean Warren and the stars at the time. And uh, when she started having, you know, feeling lonely and all that stuff, uh, uh, I took care of her and even the kids who stayed with me um, at the time and she never had any relationship with anybody who was still very good friends. She lived with the kids now in Atlanta, in uh, at the Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Stiles will give me the advice because he went through the same thing. He said, you never get remarried except after five years <laughs> from the divorce so you can make a right decision. And I followed his advice. And um, uh, Kay uh, used to run the family house. Uh, what if you have here a transplant house, that's with a, a mirror image or a, a duplicate, what we call in Pittsburgh family house. We used to have four or five of them. And she was into the, uh, 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 hotel business so she knows how to run all that stuff uh, from an excellent family I heard a lot of good stuff about her mom and dad I never met but they died before I uh, before I met her and uh, because of the patient never been married before had juvenile diabetes when she was nine and um, uh, heard a lot about me from the patients so uh, uh, the matchmakers were the patients, uh, or they would they call them. Uh, so uh, uh, Steve, uh, uh, not to Steve Coyle, uh, can't remember his last name. He's about not, 28 years now after a multi mm -hmm. uh, He used to come to the clinic, he said, Doctor, Kim, you need to get married. You know, you're taking care of the kids. You need somebody to help you. I said, Steve, get out of my face. He said, I have a good one for you. <laughs> and, uh, he, and he goes and tell Kay the same thing in the family house. And uh, it's thought every patient said, you can, you know, you need to marry Kay. You need to marry. I said, who is Kay? You know, my relationship with the patient. They came to me, so you need to marry Kay. I said, who is Kay? 
K is running the family house called the used to shady side family house. So um, uh, they make the arrangement and uh, uh, she trying to help with me with the kids from a distance, uh, bought some tickets, uh, Mario Lemieux tickets and I took the kids and then I sent her a thank you note and, and then uh, the coordinator said, you need to take her out for dinner to thank her. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so uh, I promised them, I called her, I said, I'll take you out for dinner uh, because of this beautiful uh, uh, time we had at the Mario Lemieux tournament for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there was the basketball. Mm -hmm. And the boys love the basketball. So that day I did a transplant and then I asked the coordinator or the circulating nurse to call her. I said, call a girl, her name is Kay. Tell her that I, um, I would, uh, I'm not able to make it uh, tonight because I'm doing a multi-viscera. She answered, said, I understood, uh, good luck. And that took another year, one complete year before I contacted her again, or she contacted me. One year, I swear. And then I started realizing that the five years on the, on the, on the, uh, very close to five years now. So I, uh, I called her, I said, um, uh, I want to take you out for dinner after I studied everything. And uh, we would take out for dinner first time. You know, the Muslims don't date. I never dated her except to that night. I said, I decided to take you out for dinner because I decided to marry you. And she, <laughs> she was shaky. <laughs> I swear, she was shaking <laughs> for the Italian restaurant. Ironically, uh, she uh, lived in the same area. She went to the same high school that my kids went to. She grew up in the same area where we lived. And um, then I called her next night, day. I said, um, I said, do you mind if you meet Dr. Stasel? She said, no, I, I don't mind. So I called Dr. Terry. I said, I need to talk to Dr. Stasel. So he said, what's going on? I said, I want you to meet a girl. He never said who or why. He said, Terry, bring her over. He didn't even, you know, we, we can, we can, we can think alike. We can, mm -hmm. he said, bring her over, Terry. So she went on Friday, it was Friday afternoon, the 2nd of July. The day before the 3rd of July, so the 3rd of July was Saturday, and met her on the 2nd of July, spent two hours, and um, I tried to call him after him, she met with, with her, and she called me, she said, I spent two hours with Dr. Stiles, and I said, wow, okay, <laughs> and um, he never called me back, I couldn't sleep the whole night, and then in the morning, he used to go uh, something called the Hidden Valley in, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, nice area. He has a small place there. He goes disappear and go and do write paper there. And 10 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from the uh, operator. She said, your friend wants to talk to you. So get on the phone. He said, good morning. I said, good morning, sir. He said, marry her. I said, can I ask why? He said, because she will take care of the kids and you and hang up. And that's what the story uh, of me having my second uh, wife. As you can see, uh, you always have to have a father figure in, in, in your life and uh, people you trust. And uh, so you can, um, and he did the same thing with me. I used to judge him for some decisions that pre prevent him from uh, uh, doing it. Uh, um, research is honesty. And that's one thing that the young generation has to learn. Um, I never published any paper without addressing a problem, not say, saying how good I am. 
doesn't matter how good I am. What matter is what can I teach the new generation uh, how to uh, uh, conduct a, uh, a, a true research to help with the patient problem, get a problem, clinical problem, try to solve it, and tell the new generation how to solve it and what can you do to help with the patient. Uh, and scientifically, you have to be honest. Uh, what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. Uh, not to say how good I am. And, uh, you know, if you know, you know that here I collect more than anybody else, um, that uh, if you read all the publication I have, there was always a problem I'm trying to solve. And there are some problems I need to solve in the future. So each paper, it's a series that each paper lead to the second paper, even two or three years later. So even when I uh, give the talk in the American, Co American Surgical Association 2019, I introduced the next uh, technique that I'm gonna uh, publish two years earlier. And exactly what I told them that I'm gonna in two years, I present to you a new procedure for the rotation, which was published uh, last October. Right. Um, why I'm telling you all of that, because Stuzzle, the thing that I admired in him in honesty, mm -hmm. um, and even if sometimes he's biased during a, uh, the, a trial, trying to uh, believe, trying to make, trying to convince himself that his, his theory is correct. But quickly, once he had an evidence that he was wrong, then he said he's wrong in a hidden way, in a scientific way. Right. As long as you're doing the right thing, things will prevail. So Dr. Karim, few more questions. Um, one is, what are your hobbies outside of work? Excuse me? What are your hobbies outside of work? Oh, my uh, hobbies uh, too. Uh, or three, actually. Uh, the first hobby is to make everybody crazy, <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, including uh, my staff and my wife and everybody. Second hobby is uh, to keep in touch with my patients and knows everything about them and their family. Uh, this is really, uh, I enjoy it a lot. Um, uh, number three is the gardening. I love gardening. Um, I have a big, uh, uh, when I came to Cleveland, I have a big front yard uh, that I uh, planted more than 200 trees there. I talk to them. I get, uh, I'm a, 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 a fanatic of uh, the Japanese maples. Mm -hmm. I love roses. I have a rose garden. I spend the whole summer, every weekend, um, uh, in the uh, in the front yard, do everything by myself, plant the trees by myself. I don't think I can do it now. Uh, this over the last 10 years, when I moved from Pittsburgh, I took all the trees, younger trees I planted two years before, and I got a, hired a guy we took them out, dig them out, and they transplanted them to in Cleveland. I have an ICU behind my house for the sick plants until they recover from their illness. Uh, so gardening is, uh, is uh, my hobby, and I love plants, I love trees. Uh, I have my neighbor now who's uh, uh, the uh, the uh, prior CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, do you remember him? No, I don't remember. Tom something? Yeah, the, uh, who was that? I know. Uh, uh, not Tom. Uh, it's Toby Casgrove. Toby, yeah. Yes, it's Toby Casgrove. Toby Casgrove become my neighbor now. He, uh, he moved to our neighbor last year after he retired. And the worst thing he did, and I punished him for it, if he cut all the trees, was in the back <laughs> front yard. <laughs> so, I, I uh, so, the, there. <laughs> so the city, the city of Bratno, 
um, uh, established a rule that any new owner in this village uh, would not allow to touch any tree without permission from the city. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is um, uh, uh, this is our my hobbies uh, at the present time. Okay, uh, Dr. Karim, question for you is: What are your plans regarding your Egypt plans and your hospital in Egypt? Uh, is it complete? What is uh, your plan? Are you planning to go back? Are you planning to stay here and move in between the countries? Well, this is uh, uh, complete the cycle now. Uh, thank you, Harak, for asking this question. Uh, as you can see, uh, my mission all was uh, to go back to Egypt, and that's what uh, I promised my mother, uh, late mother, uh, to do before she died. And I work in it for the last five years now, in a, and I'm in a transition uh, to dedicate more time uh, for the Egyptians and the Middle Eastern people because they cannot afford coming to the United States. And uh, sometimes either they're too sick or too poor, even to go to a uh, good hospital in, in Egypt. Uh, I can see a lot of uh, uh, evolution in the medical field in Egypt in certain hospitals. Uh, they reach a level uh, equivalent to United States or sometimes higher, but it's all private practice, most of it. and. Uh, uh, good number, I mean, more than 50% of the patients in, in Egypt, they cannot afford it. So they are lost between the public hospitals, the university hospital, which nobody really pay attention to them. And the Middle East uh, uh, above all, you know. Uh, so I established this, the foundation, uh, it's about three years old now, uh, called the Karim Abul Mag Foundation. And um, um, uh, participated in the development uh, of a uh, hospital that we renovated, that had never been used, it was donated by a, uh, a late uh, guy who used to make crystals and stuff like that. And uh, it's a beautiful hospital, and I have now uh, about uh, two operating rooms and 36 beds and I trained, I established over the last five years, I picked up some excellent surgeons like you in the university and they working with me now full time when I go there. And I'm um, in a transition now, I did the first case, actually a child from Libya that he was in contact with me, thanks to the social media, Herak, I, uh, uh, I uh, receive about 10, 15, 20 uh, uh, cases uh, uh, on the WhatsApp from all over the world, uh, Middle East, Egypt. Uh, um, and uh, actually the first patient I did in the charity hospital was in December. A child who never ate or drank is 14 years old, <coughs> failed uh, chronic interposition um, a few times and he was living on a tube feeding and um, I, uh, I was able to uh, reconstruct him and um, uh, for the first time in his life, he started eating and drinking. And uh, of course, uh, this is a charity hospital, <clears throat> cost to the patient nothing. As a matter of fact, the foundation, all the patient come from the Middle East um, uh, and Asia. Uh, that the foundation has uh, uh, accommodated them. Uh, we found the hotels for them, and in a, in a, in a, in a uh, stage now, uh, we're building a uh, like a, a, a house, uh, three floors or five floors, and with apartments for this patient to stay in. Uh, that would be cost effective than us paying for their stay in a hotel. Right. And um, I've done about maybe 15 cases now in this hospital with different, uh, only I do the complex patients, <laughs> not the patient, nobody uh, was able to help them. Uh, so that is, uh, that's a mission. Hopefully uh, one of you guys will wonder welcome. I would invite to come and uh, volunteer and spend some time there and uh, we welcome all of you, and I want you to do the same thing in your home country. I'm sure India is in need as much as in Egypt to uh, a young generation like all of you, Dr. Reddy and 
and Herak and and the other and the bad boy uh, what's his name <laughs> and Dr. Sain uh, huh and Dr. Sain yeah you know, all of them uh, to and they you guys doing a great job and and it's right. uh, uh, definitely a price uh, or uh, you know something we own our home country and uh, that's what I want to be well known for not what I uh, accomplished in the medical field but uh, mm -hmm. how much how many people that I did help and how many pe poor people that I was able to change uh, their life right sir okay last couple of questions any plans to visit India I would love to uh, you know uh, uh, I would more than happy uh, I was invited a few times but I was never able to make it uh, but uh, it would be my pleasure to come and visit you guys. Uh, there's no doubt. And I'm proud of all of you. And um, uh, Ravi, actually, I helped him doing the first uh, uh, small bowel transplant. I was with him in the middle of the night when he went on the donor and when he did the recipient and uh, post-operative care. I vividly remember and they gave me a great pleasure uh, to help out. I never believe in boundaries, Hirak or Dr. Reddy, never believe in boundaries. I never felt a stranger in the United States when I came here because the, the universe is, is owned by God, uh, not by America, not by India. All of these are false boundaries. Uh, I never believed in that and I'll be more than happy uh, to help in every way I can. Uh, uh, anywhere in the world. Actually, as a matter of fact, I have a uh, Canadian patient that's coming to Egypt. Um, uh, I'm going to Egypt in four days, or, or actually uh, next uh, Thursday, me and my wife I have a small place there that we built so I can live in it. And she could be comfortable there and she believed in my mission. That's very important thing also for the young generation uh, that uh, yeah, uh, you take care of your family, your family will take care of you and your mission. And uh, the girl cannot come here to the United States and Cleveland Clinic or anywhere for me to do the new procedure for the meditation I developed. Mm -hmm. uh, so she, uh, 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 Brittany coming to uh, Egypt next week and I will do her surgery there. That's awesome. So, so I'll be more than happy to uh, come and uh, hurry up before I, uh, I, I to be a, a chair, you know, a wheelchair bound. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think you're ever going to retire. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but now that we know Dr. Reddy, we must invite him over. Okay, last question for you. If not a transplant surgeon, what would you have become? Uh, or let's say if not a, uh, if you were not in the medical field, what would you have become? I would be in the medical field. I didn't see myself. I didn't see myself. God, here in Iraq, uh, the doctor already is. Um, God, God, before God creates you, he know he had a mission for you on earth. Mm -hmm. And um, I never, ever, ever in my life made a decision. Uh, all my decisions comes to me and God opened the door. Uh, whoever your God is, open the door for you to accomplish your mission. So I don't think we have any choice. Uh, you never had a choice to choose. You never had a choice to choose your mom or your dad, your mom and your dad your mom and your dad so I truly believe in that um, my kids used to say um, uh, both of them uh, refused to go to the medical field and uh, when I discussed with them when they finished the high school going to the college in Pittsburgh they said dad we can uh, can we uh, do you think we're going to hurt your feeling if we say we're not interested in the medical field I said, no, you can do whatever you want. You could be successful in anything. You, mm -hmm. As long as you help humanity and you make your life valuable and has a mission in life, that's all counts. He said, no, you're lying to us. I said, why? He said, because we believe that you believe 
that, that if you're not a doctor, you don't deserve to live on, on, to live because you're not good enough. I said, that's wrong. I mean, I believe in my mission. It does not mean everybody has to do the same thing. So I really never ask my question whether I will be uh, anything else. Uh, if, if you need an answer, I will choose anything that would be creative to help the humanity. Okay. And um, finally, Dr. Kareem, do you have anything, any message for us in India? Uh, we, for, to the Liver Transplant Society of India, like especially in the field of small bowel transplant or any other message, how to, how to move forward and uh, anything else that you would like to share with us? So um, as, as, as we uh, stressed out all the, uh, during the, uh, our conversation, uh, uh, there is a lot all of you could do. It does not have to be a small bowel transplant. Mm -hmm. It does not have to be a liver transplant. Try to help your people. Try to heal them. Uh, try to re-establish a career in gut rehabilitation. I mean, nothing better than your own organ. Preventive medicine. Uh, take care of the patient, whatever they need. And uh, go down to the street and be part of the, uh, the fabric of the society. So you can see the problem that you can help with. Uh, of course, you're in the medical field. So that is will be the fabric that you can strengthen and improve. Teach your young generation the principles um, uh, and uh, humanity in, in its way. I didn't know how medicine is practiced in India, but what I teach the people in Egypt now don't be hunger for money. When you, when you take care of the patient, take care of them, not for the sake of the money, take care of them because they're human beings. They're your mother, they're your father, they're brother and sister. Uh, teach the new generation, the morals and ethics and principles in life that will live with them forever. So the whole thing could change. Um, of course, the uh, system in Egypt and in India, and I'm sure the same way, there is no structure that will guide the new generation to make a difference in life. And that's your role here, I can, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Singh and, and, and Ravi and all of you, that to establish uh, is as important as developing a new procedure or a small bowel transplant or liver transplant or pancreas or whatever, it's as important to develop a new generation to uh, carry the mission uh, when we all gone. Um, um, it's uh, very, you could save millions of life by simple procedures, not just a transplant uh, or by something innovative that prevent them from requiring a transplant. Uh, and uh, that is, it takes time. Establish a system that will survive in its own uh, before, um, uh, uh, before we go. Uh, one bad thing I learned from my experience in Pittsburgh, when I left, I didn't leave the foundation on the administrative level to protect what I developed there. Uh, pediatric uh, program doing well. The adults uh, was shaky because there was no infrastructure in the administrative mind uh, to keep uh, what I developed there. And I'm trying to avoid this from happening here in Cleveland. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that what I developed in Cleveland, of course, what I developed in Pittsburgh um, uh, definitely made a huge difference there and in the field in general, but also in, in Cleveland here uh, that um, I wanna make sure before I retire or step down or uh, slow down on my activity that I have a team 
uh, uh, somebody like you that uh, 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 that they carrying the mission, and I have a good number of them. I'm sure uh, uh, you uh, you know most of them here. I can you work with us here for quite some time. Things actually more autonomy now, and uh, and uh, they are in their own now. And I'm just watching from a distance uh, that uh, they're doing the right thing for the patient. Well, thank you, Dr. Kareem. That was really enlightening and uh, we loved getting your opinion and talking to you just is always so amazing. Dr. Reddy, thank do you have any questions? Uh, no, I think that was an excellent interview, Professor Kareem. Actually, it's, it's an honor to listen to you. It's, uh, you know, the, the vibrancy with which you talk is what um, is, is most impressive, actually. And, you know, your long career it, 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 it does teach a lot to youngsters like us and, and you know, I hope our readers will also like it as much. Thank you, Edmund. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Dr. I appreciate your time. Huh? We, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And Thank uh, you, Harak. And uh, you guys go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Go, go okay. I'm sure both uh, Dr. of you... Kareem, before we <laughs> sign off, we need a couple of pictures from you. And definitely one with your family and one in which you are gardening. And any any other picture that you would like to share with us, we would be happy. Yeah, I would. Uh, I will. Uh, Amanda, help me to do that. Yeah, we have a lot of them. Amanda, we need at least four or five pictures. Nice will, pictures. Will, okay, will. outside the hospital, inside and outside. I'll be, I'll be more than happy to do. So. And one re one request, uh, if if you can also share a picture of you with. Charles and his old sure. you know, yes, you yes, as a yes. young, you as a young uh, man who with those eyelashes. Uh. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I uh, tell you one story. Uh, Adam, my son, was eight years old, and I think I have a picture of me and him and Starzo. And he wrote um, a, an essay in the uh, elementary school, and uh, he, uh, Adam said, Dad, can I interview Dr. Starzo? I said, sure. So I took him to the office and uh, me and him and Starzl uh, spent some time together. And one of the question, Adam, uh, after that, we have the picture, I'll send it to you. After uh, that, Adam asked him at the end of his uh, uh, interview, Dr. Starzl, he said, yes, Adam. Um, uh, he said, um, what make you decide or make you think about liver transplant? He said, a moment of madness. It, yeah, exactly. That's what he told him. It's a moment of madness. Uh, so, and that's also tell you that uh, Starzl, uh, tell a few uh, weeks before he died, he would always have interest in my boys and asking about them all the time. All right. We will send you some pictures uh, on the way we uh, text, we email it to you or send it uh, through WhatsApp, uh, Herak, okay? Thank you, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. All right, we you guys go to bed and then time. wake up your family, okay? Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye, Herak. Bye, man.